This lady knows nothing about Mothman. How in the world would she coincidentally have made this up? Doesn't sound plausible to me. So, uh, you know, possible to make it up. So that, in my mind, is a, is a good witness and somebody that I'm definitely going to want to talk to and follow through and usually ends up, you know, somebody documented in my book. I couldn't agree more. When I get a contact from an eyewitness and someone that says, I've never had any interest in any of this stuff. I have no interest in, you know, that, but I had this one experience and I, you know, I got to tell somebody. That is pretty compelling as opposed to somebody that says, man, I grew up, you know, watching all the Bigfoot shows, Mothman or whatever. Not that, again, it's impossible that someone like that would have an experience or an encounter. Looking objectively at it says, okay, there might be some emotional mind influence here at work in terms of the person, you know, maybe misinterpreting what they saw and kind of turning it into something maybe a little bit more special or, you know, misidentification does happen and that's something we can talk about as well that, you know, you have different, you have three main reasons that, that are, uh, an alleged sighting might not be viable. Uh, fabrication, which is very unfortunate, but that happens a lot where there are people just out there that are just, you know, basically making things up, hoaxing and so forth. We have to weave through that a lot. Um, hallucination, and, uh, you know, not to sound unkind here, but my research has indicated that there's 150 million people in the world that have some level of dementia. And that doesn't mean that they're, you know, already that you're, you know, you're going to put the butterfly net over them and scoop them away. It means they can live completely, seemingly completely normal lives in every other aspect of their lives, but they have one fantasy life, you know, and so those are the kinds of things that we learn. And then the third thing is but misidentification, because people do sometimes interpret things, you know, particularly startling events where you're on a, a lonely, dark road at night driving down and something happens suddenly you're not expecting, and then your emotions take over and sometimes your mind wants to fill in the blanks, so to speak, as to what you think you may have seen. So. Right, so you know, those are the things that you, know, you have to look for when you're evaluating. I think some people are under the impression that more witness, more sightings are better, you know, quantity over quality. But to me, you know, if I boil it down to, to five super credible, super good stories, super, those those carry more weight and more impact. So, you know, if, if we're filming a documentary or a television show, we're not trying to fill it with a hundred witnesses. You may mention that hundreds of people have seen it, but what you really want to focus on are the ones that you think are the most credible, because those carry more weight and, and have impact, because these are seemingly credible, well-spoken people. And when you hear them, you say, wow, those people saw something. We can't exactly wait to say what it is, but, but we saw something, and th so that's what you got to look for. If, you know, if, if you if you have a paranormal investigation group or you're a Bigfoot group or whatever, um, you know, don't don't be so. It, it's not a contest. You don't need to publish uh, hundreds of reports on your website. Just publish the good ones, and that's what brings people back because they go, yeah. Every time I read what these guys investigate, it's good stuff. But if you every week post a bunch of uh, you know, photos and undocumented stuff, it just sort of creates white noise and that's not really serving the, you know, the case or the cryptid or, or trying to prove it. Okay, so another way to look at this in terms of vetting eyewitnesses is, you know, there's nothing that beats direct testimony, person to person. I'm sure Lyle's the same way, but I often get frustratingly accounts where people come to me and say, Dude, the dog man! I work with a guy whose uncle saw that! So now you're already three people removed from the original eyewitnesses. You got the guy that told you the story, it's his uncle, now you gotta try to track down the guy that actually had the account. And sometimes when you try to follow that path, if you think it's promising, then it gets weird and oh, the guy moved away and turned his phone off. And you know, there's always like some kind of bugaboo where it's like, oh man, I can't spend a lot of time on this. So you always wanna have direct testimony, you wanna look into a person's eyes, you know, we. And, you know, not to make it sound threatening, but I guess we use a lot of the same techniques that, you know, police interviewers and investigators use. You're reading body language, you know, you're trying to get a feel for the person, for their credibility, and there are certain body signs and languages that you can kind of interpret and read as to whether how sincere someone is. Furthermore, if there's nothing more compelling, and he was talking about lots and lots of sightings, but there's nothing really more compelling than a multiple eyewitness sighting. I mean, one person's testimony can be very riveting if they're very sincere, 
But when you have two corroborating witnesses at the scene who are describing exactly the same thing, and you can even separate those people and interview them separately and they corroborate each other, that's pretty convincing, right? Absolutely. And I mean, that's what the police would do if they investigated. They, you know, if you ran down there and two or three people said they saw something, they're going to immediately separate you and have you write down exactly what you saw. In fact, in, in my book, The Lizard Man, uh, the, the police did just that, and I was able to access these police reports. And it, it was great because, you know, each of the person, you could read what their interpretation was, and you could see a theme throughout, and you're like, you know, these people aren't making it up. So the rare occasions where you do have a multiple witness sighting, if you can indivi indivi individually interview each of these person, it's going to strengthen that, that incident greatly. Can, can I spin that back into Moth Band since that's why we're here? The very first Mothman sighting that everyone knows about, you had four witnesses. Stephen Mary Mallett and um, the Scarberries, Roger and Linda Scarberry. Four people that came in and, and, and they basically they went to the police and that's something I want to segue into na uh, next because in my mind there's nothing more credible than an eyewitness that goes to the length of going to the police and reporting it or going to a newspaper as opposed to someone that anonymously posts their sighting on a website and you know doesn't want to give more information but I mean that's a pretty that's why we're really all here that kicked off the whole Mothman movement was you had four young people in a state of panic rushing in to tell a sheriff's deputy that they had seen this you know unhuman winged creature and that was obviously became worldwide news overnight I th yeah, and I think that's one reason it, this case still stands today, because if you're like, four people were down at that TNT area and saw this thing, you're like, wow, that's, you know, and then you describe the creature, as opposed to, yeah, this dude, he was down there, he saw something, eh, you know, it doesn't carry the weight as, as it does when you read the newspaper and it talks about these four people who, who laid eyes on whatever it was they saw. You know, those are the gold, you know, those are the ones you want to go for. And in fact, Ken, in our first episode of American Monster Tour, we did have a double uh, mother-daughter who witnessed uh, the creature in question. So right off the bat, that was one reason we decided to, to film this case that we were going to investigate, because in one case, in both two cases, there was two, two witnesses. Two separate case. sightings by two people that live a couple of miles apart that to our knowledge don't know each other, have never heard, these are not published accounts, these were people that reached out in private to different investigators. So that's kind of what spawned our investigation was that it was very promising to have these similar descriptions from, you know, seemingly independent witnesses and pairs of witnesses that were together at the same time. So that always strengthens things and people seeing, you know, also people seeing things in places where it makes sense where perhaps there's a history of these. I, I was investigating, uh, you know, the Boggy Creek area. Um, I had a sighting by a, a woman who saw something in the area of Sulphur River. And, uh, you know, just to make this short, she, she was uh, driving to see her mother one morning about 10.30 a.m., so it was daytime. She was driving to see her mother in, in the hospital and she had to drive out. She lived almost in the Sulphur River and you know, at the end where the river begins. And so she drove up on these little country roads and she got up there and she realized she forgot something. So she had to stop and do kind of a three point turn and turn around. She said she started going and she sees something standing in the road. There's a big wooded uh, tree line here and then it kind of runs out into a field. And she said she just stopped and looked and this thing was standing right in the middle of the road. She said it was about maybe five feet tall it was covered in brown hair, it was on two legs, and it looked like some somebody maybe wearing a Halloween costume. That was the first, first thing that popped in her mind. But as the thing stood there and looked and then turned and ran back into the woods, she said, at that point I could tell it wasn't a person in a costume, it was some kind of an animal. She said, I could see the way the hair moved, the way it moved, the way it turned and ran. And this lady, you know, uh, I was lucky to have even known about this sighting because after that she went and stopped at a convenience store and was kind of all shook up and just happened to mention something to the clerk there about this and got to talking. And well, as I know a lot of people in that area, word finally gave, came to me and I was able to interview this woman. But what I found about that was 
I said, well, you know, the Sulphur River has a long history of Bigfoot-like creature sightings. You know, but it's in the Boggy Creek area that feeds all the... The woman knew about the Boggy Creek, legend of Boggy Creek, it was vaguely familiar, had no idea that the Sulphur River had these sightings. She didn't know anything about it. So again, it was the right place, and this woman had seen something in daylight, and I, I thought it was a very credible witness. That, that is amazing, and you've told me that story, and I agree with you. That, that's the kind of situation as an investigator you hope for. Um, going to the next level, because you know we're going to make a full admission here, which is in what we do, cryptid investigation, physical evidence is almost non-existent, frustratingly enough. I think you could make a better case for something like Bigfoot where we have some pretty good casts of tracks and some ambiguous hair samples and droppings, but there's no physical evidence for a lot of the big cryptids that we look for. And that doesn't mean we're not looking for physical evidence. That's our main focus. If we could find body or remains or a bone or something that we could substantially prove um, without a doubt and without you know being refuted. So most of the evidence we look for is anecdotal or circumstantial, which is eyewitness testimony, and then you look at you know legends and old stories that corroborate the newer sightings and accounts. But something else I want to mention is that in the scientific world, in the true scientific world, you have field investigators, people that go out into the field and look for evidence, and then you have laboratory analysts or people that take that evidence and they're objective because they didn't find it, and they're looking at it in an objective way and trying to analyze it and interpret it. Now we don't always have that luxury because there's not very many scientists that are willing to look at anything we find and so on. So we, we kind of play both roles. But one big trap or mistake that I see a lot of f uh, field investigators, particularly less experienced field investigators make, is they're out in the field, they feel they're finding evidence that is interesting, but then they're formulating their own theories and they're very intricate theories. And you know, for example, I often come across Bigfoot researchers that I can tell are very passionate, very dedicated out there in the field, but they're giving me these elaborate theories about, oh, there's, I have a family of eight Sasquatches on my property. There's two juveniles, a female, the male's 12 feet tall, and it's like, how could you know all this? There's no way you can. What's important, if you feel that you have evidence, is to have peer review, and to turn that evidence over to other researchers that you consider and trust might be objective and look at it, and look at what your findings are discovering. You know. And don't, you know, don't give them your opinion to say, hey, this is what I found, these are my reports, these are my sightings, what do you think? You know, is there anything to this? Can you audit it? Can you give me an opinion, a perspective that's different? Because I'm too emotionally attached, perhaps, you know, being the field investigator to, you know, to my findings. Absolutely, you need that. And that's one thing, I was talking to some guy earlier, it's like you see a lot of just things being published photos and things without any documentation of first where they found them, what were the circumstances, maybe not even something for scale in the photo as well. They haven't been circulated by what would be a peer review. Run them through some of your colleagues, you know, have your family members look at it. Just do a little research and do a little uh, uh, evaluation of this before publishing the thing on the internet, which is easy, as some absolute solid, you know, we found this Bigfoot track. Well, you yeah. know, how do you know it's a Bigfoot track? Don't, don't even tell someone what, you know, Lyle, look at this. This is what I think. Just so say, tell me what you think. I just want you to look at that photo. You know, look that over for a few days and just get back to me. I mean, that would be a more objective way to present it to another researcher rather than trying to plant that seed that might lead you to where I want you to go. Yeah, there's a lot of seed planting. When somebody shows you a photo, you know, and they go, look right here, there's a dog man. Oh, I just blew it for me because you've already. Oh, I see the dog. You're man. in my head, man. <laughs> Not, but yeah, you know, at least if just say, here's a photo, and if I can just look at it objectively, and if I see a dog, man, well, maybe we got something going. But usually I don't because, you know, I was once shown a black and white photo, and the guy said, look, you can see it's got red eyes. It was, it was a. It had been dotted with two red dots. And I, I'm like, but it's a black and white photo. <laughs> but I just go, oh, yeah, that's amazing. Wow, how did that happen? And now that we're on this subject, let's talk about photographic evidence. Because, you know, we said earlier physical evidence, physical evidence, anecdotal evidence. 
why. In my, hum in my humble opinion, we've reached the point now where photographic evidence is just, it's just too inconclusive to really be considered full evidence because there are, of course, with Photoshop and the internet and social media, there are too many fake videos, photos circulating out there and people are constantly sending both of us photos. Hey, look at this, check this out. And most of them are easily discernible. Either they're too good to be true, like a dragon. Look, there's this dead dragon on the beach and it looks like something out of a movie and you're like, yeah. Oh, that... You're ruining it for me. Or yeah. it's just, you know, the, the classic, what we call a blob squatch, which is just like a shadow in the woods with a red circle or even more frustrating, 12 red circles saying, <laughs> there's a whole colony. Well, you know, going back to the, many of you have probably heard of the Patterson Gimlin Bigfoot film. Has anyone ever seen that, heard of that? So in the Bigfoot field, the thing that, that many of us really other than getting to know Bob Gimlin, one of the guys who was there, who's an extremely credible witness, is the fact that that was filmed in 1967, when special effects weren't very good, when there was no Photoshop, and the subject in the film really looks pretty darn good, better than any costume from that time period. But we've gone far beyond that point now. So when people tell me they have a photograph, I'm always telling them, really, the only photograph that I'm gonna really take seriously is something that is just literally jaw-dropping, but also makes biological sense. That yes, this is something that could exist, and unfortunately I'm not seeing a lot of that. Do we want to take questions, Lyle? Is it jumping over there? Yeah, we could. Q&A. Yeah, man. <laughs> on a Polaroid? What if the photo was on a Polaroid? You're more of the graphics guy. I mean, with that, or do people still have Polaroids? I mean, that's, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome, dude. I want to like the field investigator going out there. He, everybody's got their high tech stuff. They're smart. This dude's got a Polaroid. Like, check this out, dog. And an eight track <laughs> recorder. He could even show like the sets. Show the photo to the Bigfoot before the thing runs off. That is, a, I mean, that's a, that's a fair point. I, mean, I guess it would be harder to manipulate if you're looking at the original Polaroid image right there in front of your face, then that would certainly be more compelling than something that's being sent to you as a computer JPEG file or something like that. So. It, it could be, yeah. So it, it would eliminate much of the possibility of being digitally enhanced in some way, because obviously if you can prove that it was taken with emulsion, like in Polaroid, the only thing you have to rule out were they taking a picture of a, of a gaff or a costume or something. So there again, you're still in a conundrum of you know, if it doesn't look better than the Patterson-Gimlin film, then it's not going to, if that's not convincing scientists, then certainly something that's blobby or, or, you know, blurry, and it's like all this blurry stuff, it might be a Bigfoot. That's all I always say. It's like, dude, I'm not saying it's not a Bigfoot. It's just not good enough evidence. I can't show this and go, we finally got it. It's another blurry photo. We got to do something better. We got to do better. Okay, we're coming up on quarter till. I don't know how much time we have. Should we take? Do we have time for a couple more questions? Or yeah. Do we need yeah. to wrap this up? There's a gentleman over here that's got his hand raised, sir. I, I just want to bounce off the other guy's question. Is uh, even though Polaroid is funny, there's Yeah, the question is, is why do we keep getting photos that are, are very low quality when we have such good, you know, even your phone has a better camera than, you know, we had five years ago when there were actual cameras. So, you know, why? Uh, you know, we've talked about some of that. We had a, on this first, uh, on the documentary shoot that we're going to show you guys tonight at 7, we were in the middle of filming a scene or kind of taking a break and suddenly this deer began bounding across the freeway right in front of us and it was like there was so much traffic it was kind of crazy and Lyle was like oh that's crazy and he's getting out his phone and trying to set up and get a shot of the thing and everything happened so fast that he's just like you know and that's a lot of times how these cryptid encounters go I think is that it's just it's something anticipated no one's walking around with their camera like this so their phone you ready to take a picture and so sometimes when something unexpected happens there's that extra charge of emotion of adrenaline pumping you're fumbling with the phone, I gotta get this, oh shoot, I've got this app open, or whatever. And so that's that's what I think is a lot of times just people just aren't prepared for these situations and they happen in a split second. 
you, know, you either have two cases, one where that's the case. I couldn't even get a picture of that big old buck. By the time I got it up, it had ran in the woods. I said, Ken, if that would have been a Bigfoot, I just blew it. Big time. And, and, and so you, you have the possibility that they you know, pulled it out real fast and it was a crummy photo because the subject is not posing for a glamour photo. <laughs> Patterson Gimlin was the only one that sort of like, okay, make me an icon. And just a, a brief, to, you know, a brief explanation of the Patterson. You know, Patterson was up there to make a movie. He had it, been filming all day, and moreover, he was so prepared. Patterson was so prepared that he actually had his camera positioned in the saddlebag of the horse he was riding with one lock open, and had practiced pulling it out like a gun out of the holster. So when they rolled around the corner, he and Gimlin and, and saw this Bigfoot. Their horses were freaking out, but Patterson, to his credit, had the wherewithal to think. This is why I'm here, to get this footage. Grab the camera, he was an athlete, a rodeo rider, so he was able to pull the maneuver off where most people wouldn't have been able to do that. Right, so, you know, and, and out, anything outside of that, if it is fuzzy, blurry, probably somebody trying to hoax it because you're like, dude, you know, you at least if the thing is blurry, you can tell the difference between what was taken on a quality camera and something that looks like some Nokia that you know, they found at the bottom of the river and then took a picture. It's like, dude, you know, and people complain about that and it makes things like Bigfoot a laughing stock to the guy in the cubicle over there. It's like, you want Bigfoot? Dude, that's not real. Because what they've seen is the junk. You know, they weren't here or they didn't go to, you know, to a, look into it more seriously or even read a book. They just kind of saw some crummy photos. So that, that hurts things because it's so easy to put a crummy photo out there that's probably probably a hoax. One question someone out there might ask is, man, why, you know, you guys, you're obviously out there looking, searching, why aren't there more scientists kind of getting involved in this type of stuff? Well, I can tell you there are. Um, we have, uh, we work with PhDs. There's Dr. Jeff Meldrum from Idaho State who's really stuck his neck out, neck out in the Bigfoot field. Um, there's a PhD in my hometown of San Antonio named Haskell Hart who looked at the alleged Bigfoot DNA findings from a couple years ago, and he's a geneticist, so he actually went through the scientific peer review process of breaking that down. I'm uh, in correspondence with a PhD geneticist at the University of Freiburg in Switzerland who's told me, if you find anything, send it to me and I'll do a DNA analysis. So we're finally on the cusp of a, of a point where there are some scientists out there, some real credible scientists who are objective who are maybe willing to, to, to help guys like me and Lyle out a little bit and you know give us that extra level of scientific knowledge that we so desperately need. Any, any more questions? How do we know when we're going to stream our show? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> the, the, because we're making that sh this show and our investigations independently, it takes a lot longer to produce. We don't have a network budget. We don't have a giant team of people. We're not even, we, we didn't even kickstart this. Well, we kickstarted it right out of our back pocket. Hey, Ken, you got any money to buy me some Doritos? Because I'm hungry. <laughs> and we're also both, admittedly, I think we're both kind of perfectionists, which right. goes with our, you know, and so we're, we want it to be good, you know? So every time we do a screening or a cut, we look at it and we go, man, this is good, but... We're, and Let's we're try to boost it one more level. So we're trying to do it on the level where people kind of expect. People complain about these shows. That's not real investigational. We're trying to offer that. And so what we're doing now, it, we're still very much in the early stages. Um, it, so it, it will take a while. I mean, it might be next year before we we want to drop it as like a season because it's more episodic, not just one documentary. Um, so it takes a long time to film some in advance, but what we're trying to do here is we've got one that's, you know, finished as it gets to the point before we release as a series, but we want to show it to, the, to our fans, we want to show it to people like you, and just to get your feedback and to just kind of, you know, throw it out there because it's something that we're, we're still developing, so we thought this is a great opportunity to provide some entertainment and show it to you, but also kind of get the reaction, like, and, and we did... This is the very first time anybody on the East Coast has seen this. We, we've been very quiet about this. We've been working on it a year. We've said very little about it. You know, we're, you know, blowing the horns and trumpeting. We're quietly working on this. We showed it on the West Coast last week, and the reception was.
pretty good. I excellent. Thought, I thought it was excellent. It was excellent. People told us that, that it was, you know, what they've been waiting for. And, you know, one more thing I wanted to say about the series is that, obviously, Bigfoot is the rock star of cryptozoology for a number of reasons, and we, we are going to have a heavy dose of Bigfoot-type creatures in our resume, but we will also be expanding the horizons and introducing, if you don't know already, to cryptids like Thunderbirds, lake monsters, black panthers, a whole plethora of strange creatures that we've investigated and we think are worth investigating. So we're hoping to provide you with a good variety of subject matter. And ones that the networks may not like, but we don't have to answer to them. And that's the cool thing. It's like, we want to do a, an episode on pterosaurs, we're doing it. Nobody to answer to, and that's the cool thing, but it does take longer. But you know, in the meantime, you know, obviously we've, we've got books on these subjects. We've got book. We've got. We've been in documentaries, um, so you know, you can you can follow, catch up on what we've done so far. And this is going to translate then into American Monster Tour, which obviously is kind of a motif um, that plays into our our monster hunting as well as our our past in, in being on tour uh, with with a band. So it's kind of plays in everything that we. We've kind of converged in our lives, and it's sort of us going on the road, touring around, looking into in what we believe are interesting cases, and what we hope you find as interesting cases. Well, we appreciate your time today, and we certainly hope that many of you will, I know it's been a long day, everyone's hot, everyone's tired, but we certainly hope you do what you have to do, go refresh, get, get into the air conditioning for a few minutes, but we hope a lot of you will be back here at seven o'clock to, to check out our special screening and to really give us feedback, because we do, appreciate all of you and you know really we couldn't do what we do and wouldn't be able to do what we do without you and we want to thank you for that it's all about you give yourselves a round of applause thank you guys thank you so much and the screen the it runs 45 minutes so from seven till roughly eight so thanks so much thank you That was really good. I like that. Um, where is that going to be um, available? Like, where is it going to be shown? Uh, is it going to be on DVD or? Yeah, yeah. We'll release really our DVDs of it, but you know, streaming anywhere. You can get streaming like Amazon, iTunes. Okay. Streaming type channel rather than network TV. Okay, that's cool. Um, are, what other episodes are you guys going to be doing? Like, what other um, monsters do you think? We're not totally have it mapped out, but we shot we've shot a swampy Bigfoot one, a, a uh, phantom cat episode. Cool. And, you know, there's a lot of Bigfoot cases, yeah. obviously. So. Yeah, I like it. It's like a travel show. You're kind of just traveling around yeah, different places, like a that, yeah, American yeah, Monster Tour. And, you know, just around the country. Yeah, it's really cool. Okay. Thank you. Peace.